Am I allowed to vape on camera? Should I vape on camera? I know vaping is kind of icky, but I'm also trying to slow down on how much Eid way I'm smoking A in Roblox, so I'm just gotta do something with my mouth. And, oh, what she said? Queen. Welcome back to the channel. Me and Dino are some city boys and we're just hanging out, vibing. And today we're gonna talk about Avatar The Last Airbender, one of my favorite shows. But I believe Aang can save the world. That I've been rewatching for comfort since I was, since I had hair, to put it that way. Avatar is one of my favorite shows. It was created by Nickelodeon in 2005. It drew record numbers and talked about some complex themes that were never seen before in children's media like this. In anticipation of Netflix announcing a live action remake, as well as some other reboots being talked about, there's lots of constant discussion surrounding continuing the show or remaking Avatar The Last Airbender, but lots of exciting news happening, although M. Night Shyamalan kinda gave me PTSD when anyone touches the Avatar franchise. Well, no, you know, the, the critics are, I don't know what's going on with me and the critics in the United States, I gotta tell you. Um... He made a really, really terrible remake of the movie. It seemed like he just watched the summary of the show, but only the first half, and he did it while on two tabs of LSD and some shrooms, and then got someone else, and then he gave that summary to somebody else who then made the movie. Because if you watch the movie, they mispronounced the main character's name the whole time. Like, the entire time. Critics are, I don't know what's going on with me and the critics in the United States, I gotta tell you. Um... Like, if you're gonna make a video, at least try to pronounce things correctly. I mean, listen, I'm not one to talk. I'm not making high-quality shit here. <laughs> but, M. Night Shyamalan just made me wary of people trying to touch Avatar because it's my baby, it's my child. But getting into the main cartoon that we all know and love, in this video we're gonna break down everything that makes Avatar The Last Airbender one of the best animated series you could ever watch. Avatar The Last Airbender is set in a world where human civilization consists of four nations named after the four classical elements, the Water Tribe, the Earth Kingdom, the Fire Nation, and the Air Nomads. In each nation, certain people known as benders, waterbenders, earthbenders, firebenders, and airbenders, have the ability to telekinetically manipulate and control different elements corresponding to their nation. Identity, baby, it's important. Racial divides. Let's discuss. The Avatar is the only individual with the ability to bend all four elements. Kendall Jenner, she handed the Pepsi to the cop. She was the bridge, so the Avatar is kind of like that, but um, yeah, I would say each premise, both the Pepsi, Kendall Jenner commercial, and the premise of Avatar are equally as ridiculous in very different ways. But anyway, the Avatar is the bridge between all of the nations, being able to bend all of the different elements. The Avatar is an international arbiter whose duty it is to maintain harmony among the four nations and acts as a mediator between humans and spirits. When the Avatar dies, the spirit is reincarnated into a new body who will be born to the parents in the next nation set in an order. Air, water, earth, fire. The Avatar can enter a condition known as the Avatar state in which they temporarily gain every single skill of their past Avatar lives. And if the Avatar were ever to be killed in this state, that would completely end the cycle. This is an important premise for like the entire show, but also I just want to give people the opportunity who have never watched the show to kind of just have an understanding of what we're dealing with here. The show begins a century ago. A young Avatar, Aang, afraid of his new responsibilities, fled from his home and was forced into the ocean by a storm. He encased himself in suspended animation in an iceberg near the South Pole. Shortly afterward, the Fire Lord Sozin ruled the Fire Nation and launched a world war to expand his nation's entire empire. Knowing that the Avatar must have been an air nomad because the previous Fire Avatar died, he committed a genocide against the entire air nomad nation with the help of a comet that enhanced the Firebender's powers. A hundred years later, two siblings, Katara and Sokka, teenagers of the Southern Water Tribe, accidentally discovered Aang and revive him. The first season follows Aang, Katara, and Sokka traveling to the Northern Water Tribe so Aang can learn waterbending and prepare to defeat the Fire Lord. Prince Zuko, the banished son of the current Fire Lord, Ozai, pursues them accompanied by his uncle Iroh, hoping to capture the Avatar and restore his honor. Aang is also pursued by multiple other high-ranking officials of the Fire Nation, and the Fire Nation Navy will eventually follow him to the Northern Water Tribe, where they will both attempt to kill the Avatar and destroy the entire Water Nation by destroying the Moon Spirit. This is the anime 
anime, you have to be into anime. Like you have to like buy into the fantasy of a moon spirit that gives people a power to move water with their minds or a comet will give people the ability to blast fire hotter out of their hands. It's a good show, trust me. When the Navy attacks, we see Aang performing his duties as the Avatar for the first time in a major way, defeating the Fire Nation and sending them back in their first major defeat of the entire war. In the second season, Aang learns from Earthbender, Toph Bay Fong, Team Badass, Disabled Woman, Iconic. Prince Zuko and his uncle Iroh, now fugitives from the Fire Lord, become refugees in the Earth Kingdom eventually settling in its capital, Ba Sing Se. Both groups are pursued by Azula, Zuko's younger sister, during an eclipse, during which firebenders would be powerless. Azula instigates a coup d'etat, bringing the capital under the Fire Nation control, and Zuko sides with his sister. Aang is fatally wounded by Azula, but he's revived by Katara. In the third season, Aang and his allies invade the Fire Nation capital during the solar eclipse, but are forced to retreat. Zuko abandons the Fire Nation to join Aang and teach him firebending. Aang, raised by monks to respect all life, wrestles with the possibility that he must kill Fire Lord Ozai to end the war. When Sozin Comet returns, and Fire Lord Ozai plans to burn the entire world down, psycho bitch, Aang confronts Ozai and uses his avatar power to strip Ozai of firebending abilities. Meanwhile, Aang and friends liberate Ba Sing Se, destroy the Fire Nation fleet, and capture Azula, the Fire Nation princess. Zuko is then crowned the Fire Lord, and the war comes to an end. Yay! Happy ending. But it's within that entire plot that not only just full of whimsy and magic and all that nerd shit that I like, but it also provided so much depth and nuance. It aligned with character motivations, and archetypes. The series addressed many topics rarely addressed on in youth entertainment, including issues related to war, genocide, imperialism, colonialism, and totalitarianism, gender discrimination and female empowerment, marginalization and oppression, as well as the philosophical questions surrounding fate, destiny, and free will. Let me get comfy, because this, this, is, this is my shit. This is my part. This is my favorite part. The discussion. We're gonna discuss the themes. There's all these different themes that are directly opposed to each other. And I think that's the beauty within the show. So for example, gender discrimination and female empowerment, specifically with Katara in season one, where she faces gender discrimination in the Northern Water Tribe, where she's informed that in the Northern Water Tribe, they actually don't teach women to water bend. We see her liberate the other women of the Water Tribe and fight for their right to bend. And I think there's so many aspects about this that the show gets right in this day and age that's so important for people to understand was Katara, who is a waterbender from the Water Tribe, to solve these social Water Tribe issues. I'll be outside if you're man enough to fight me. <gasps> Today that's an important discussion to be had. Outsiders trying to fix issues in other countries, homophobia in the Middle East. It's not these colonizers that are going to come and fix these problems that they also created. It's going to be the people from those nations because they have to be done in line with the community and their understanding of the world around them. Because you'll see in the show, each of them also lives in such different environments like the world today. The waterbenders live in the North and South Pole, which is completely made by snow and ice. The Earth Kingdom is vast and huge and has lots of different diversity and topography. The Fire Nation is a small island nation. Air nomads are all dead, so like kind of sad, but like, also an example of the real world where we actually genocided our indigenous people here in the Americas and in Africa and in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Anyway, we, we fucked over a lot of people and genocided quite a few different people. So pick the group of people you want. We murdered them. You can make them the air nomads. Not we, but like, I guess kind of we, the world. Who is, I don't know, the, the few fucking white men who made a couple of decisions, fuck them. But yeah, we were talking earlier about gender discrimination in season one and how it provided a nuance that most people kind of glaze over in the show. In addition to like the marginalization and oppression that different people face at different capacities. So the Fire Nation, while it was the world's oppressor and it was the occupier of everything, we saw oppression come in many different forms in internally in the Earth Kingdom, internally in the Water Tribe. We saw it come in the form within the group dynamics with Sokka being a non-bender. I'm sorry, I didn't count you. You know, no bending and all. I can still fight! Okay. Three on three plus Sokka. All these different themes are explored in such nuanced ways because it didn't just give us this one character arc of a hero fighting a war, good versus evil. Prince Zuko fight with this oppression from his father and parental abuse and his sibling as well. So 
Azula had mommy issues, crazy girl that'll kill you. Zuko had daddy issues, dom daddy with a chip on his shoulder. And I like how that those problems accurately reflect their decisions. So I see the motivations for Zuko and his behavior to chase down the avatar because it's the only way for him to regain his father's love. Once I deliver the avatar to my father, he will welcome me home with honor. Azula, who literally goes into hallucinations about her mom, her feelings of like inadequacy and that she's just like pure evil. My own mother. She was right, of course, but it still hurt. And she spirals out of control. And those are two very valid ways to react to trauma. I mean, there's genetic factors and environmental factors that would lead one to either be crazy or to go on a redemption arc. The fact that this isn't a children's cartoon is crazy. Or the fact that I'm able to pull this out of a children's cartoon and it for it to even make a little bit of sense is kind of cool. And imperialism with the Fire Nations. Yes, the Fire Nation are occupiers and they're kind of depicted as evil, but then we go into the Fire Nation and we see how propaganda affects everyday citizens who probably don't actually care about the war. Good morning, class. Recite the Fire Nation Oath. My life I gave to my country. With my hands I fight for Fire Lord. We'll begin with a pop quiz on our great march of civilization. What year did Fire Lord Sozin battle the Air Nation Army? Air Nomads didn't have a formal military. I don't know how you could possibly know more than our national history book. The facts of the colonies and the hierarchy that happens between those who are in the colonies and those who live in the Fire Nation mainland. What'd you say, colony trash? The caste system in a way. Like we just see so many different social networks. The show could have easily just been like Fire Nation, bad. They burn stuff and take over towns. We see in the Earth Kingdom, we see cities that are independent before the Fire Nation. We see them post-occupation. We see the resistance and the complexities that have to go with naming all Fire Nation citizens murderers and going after them all or trying to decipher who's innocent and who's guilty. Oh, you're so cute! Sure, he's cute now. But when he's older, he'll join the Fire Nation army. He'll be a killer. Does that look like the face of a killer to you? And move on from these four nation divides. And it's quite interesting because this discussion happens today with identity politics and with the modern nation state is are we one, are we truly one race of people that all need to take care of each other or are these divisions important for security and to foster protection for our own and what's more important should people isolate themselves and have everyone take care of themselves is that truly the best thing or do we need to learn some level of cooperation or is all cooperation doomed to end in conflict and just further ruining our environment <laughs> avatar explores all these in such interesting ways because we constantly get two different perspectives the favorite character of the show uncle iroh is my favorite character he's so charming and funny and like kind of sexy He's also complicit in war crimes. He was the first person that tried to invade the Earth Kingdom capital and failed when his son was murdered in war. Leaves from the vine. The show literally made me feel bad for the death of a war criminal's son. How crazy is that? Like, I was literally in tears when Iroh was singing that song. The show is set during a period in which the world is engulfed in an imperialistic war initiated by the Fire Nation. While war is a constant backdrop, the show depicts these effects through the eyes of common people, the oppressed Earth Kingdom citizens, as well as the indoctrinated Fire Nation school children, to show how the war makes victims of everyone. While the Fire Nation is present as the instigator of violence, the show also depicts the systematic inequality surrounded by the residents of the Earth Kingdom in the city of Ba Sing Se, with Judy literally running that shit. Hello, my name is Judy. It wasn't the Earth Kingdom, it wasn't Azula, and the nefarious acts of the city police. So in Liberated Ba Sing Se, the propaganda was going so strong. They were literally fighting a war, but internally these political bureaucrats were just worried about their own money. They didn't even care about the fact that there was an army coming for their city and they would have literally all put their head on the spikes had it not been a children's cartoon. Like Game of Thrones type stuff. There's no war in Ba Sing Se. That's like corruption at that kind of scale is crazy and it does happen and that's that's a real world consequence of having centralized power in a big city with literal walls in this massive territory of land, Canada, where you have so many different provincial systems that are supposed to be subservient to the city far away that lives completely different lives because 
the Earth Kingdom so vast and so different from each other. Ba Sing Se has real, no real control over the Earth Kingdom and had its own issues. The political strife that Avatar was talking about was so far ahead of its time and it needs to be revisited. We need to be studying this. The show introduces viewers to genocide early when protagonist Aang visits his home in the Southern Air Temple. He arrives to discover his people have been massacred and displays a range of emotions from rage to loss. The character Zuko and his relationship with his father and his uncle is the series' main redemption arc. It represents the show's message that destiny and fate are not binding or set by other people, but can be changed. In season two, Zuko struggles to conform to destiny and path determined by his father, but Iroh prods him, asking, who are you and what do you want? Who are you? And what do you want? Not only is this redemption arc so iconic, but I think the fact that every single character has a fucked up relationship with their parents or some kind of non-traditional parent background where they have no parents, they've lost a parent, their parents don't speak to them, their parent tried to murder them and mutilate them. I was literally disowned for being gay and I know lots of people growing up had divorced parents, were raised by their grandparents, had alcoholic parents and they were struggling with that at home in middle school, in high school. And I think it's so interesting that the show just displays all of these. Even though it's not the focus or the plot point, it just kind of normalizes like a bunch of kids who have these different backgrounds and are still rocking it. And that's so inspirational and cool in children's media. It's not done in a silly way. It still has the childlike wonder that adults kind of get sucked out of them when they have to work like 50 billion hours a week to have credit card debt and be sad all the time. But yeah, Avatar is a great cartoon. The show also represents a diverse cast of characters to tackle the issues of marginalization. For example, Toph, a blind character, and a paraplegic boy like Teo, the show depicted characters with vulnerabilities overcome their physical and societal limitations. This is also true when it comes to the show's female characters. I just really appreciate how the show constantly provides a good debate on complicated subject matter because it's important to always understand both sides of a coin to spend it. That didn't make any sense. Understanding both sides is an important aspect to life because then you won't become an idiot on the internet who's tweeting at people to kill themselves. Because the, and today we have all these echo chambers where everyone agrees about one point and no one wants to even revisit old systems and look how they may be imposing new harms on times that are changing and environments that are adapting. And even though things have been made worse, like completely eliminating one race of people, we can still somehow move forward and try to go back to ways before even though the world will never again look the same. Avatar bringing that message forward is so powerful. There's still interest in it if everyone's constantly talking about a remake nothing comes out because people are seriously trying to take their time with this masterpiece because if you're going to remake this show it has to exceed it has to take what Avatar The Last Airbender did as a cartoon and surpass it somehow and that can be so challenging because the level of complexity it presented and brought forward in such an entertaining unique way that wasn't as simple as like the Marvel movies like what are you going to get out of Avengers? Avatar The Airbender had become a cult classic and has a large impact in the 2010s on how networks viewed animated programs. Subsequent children's show would then blur the line between youth and adult programming, featuring more adult themes. Multiple media publications have hailed Avatar the best animated series of all time. In 2013, TV Guide included Avatar among the 60 greatest cartoons of all time. In 2018, Vanity Fair ranked the series the 11th best animated TV show. IndieWire were ranked Avatar at number 36 on its 2018 list of 50 best animated series of all times. Netflix on May 15th, 2020 announced it reached number one on the platform's top series in the U.S. four days after its release and was the most popular show or film for the week of May 14th to 21. The staying power that that has, the international implications that that has, the impact on oppression that that has, the impact on bald people that that has, the intelligence that that has, the clearance that that has, the access that that has. All the characters and their traumas make sense into how they're formed as heroes and their actions that they then go forth with in this plot. Katara not murdering her mother's murderer when confronting him because she's seen as an empathetic character capable of kindness and compassion that no one else is able to show. Please spare me. As much as I hate you, I just can't do it. Which she does in a way with this killer, but in such a cool, badass way. Aang and not killing the Fire Lord and keeping to his, like, thousand-year-old culture that's completely been genocided that's probably so important to him. Sokka and his misogyny and learning to evolve from that with accepting the fact that women exist to not 
serve him. Girls are better at fixing pants than guys, and guys are better at hunting and fighting and stuff like that. I honestly, I know a lot of people like Sokka. I'm not a Sokka stan. I just don't like straight men in anything. And like, okay, Aang's straight, but like in the show, he was kind of he was very like he was a little fruity. Avatar state. And when Azula goes down, you really explore like her psyche and how hard it must have been for her as a child, even though she's a bloodthirsty murderer capable of like horrific things and that's how the show constantly talked about her. We felt pity for her when she was chained up in the end. The fact that she just didn't have a mom around like fucking sucks. A show that's able to get you to feel such a range of emotions and see nuance in all these different people and these characters in only three seasons while also making you kind of roll your eyes in a way that would make a child laugh because now you're an adult and you're a little bit above that. Some of the potty humor is like kind of whatever. It is a great show. I filmed this a couple times now and I just wanted to praise the show. I don't really have much more background to discuss. You should let me know your thoughts on Avatar. I could have really talked about Korra today but I wanted to keep it centralized on Avatar because I you can't compare anything to this show. It's the gold standard and I don't like Korra. I just don't like it. So let me know what you think. Do you have hopes for the remake? Do you have hopes for another sequel? Sound off below. Like, click, subscribe. Check the description box for important links. As usual, you'll probably see me again, hopefully with um, something else besides a tank top and laying in bed, but that's probably all you're getting. Bye. Ooh, that was a doozy. Hey, hey Dino.